This episode of Moolah Moolah was brought to you by Just Health. Hi world, this is a Frugal Millennial. Today I'm talking to Kate. So Kate, uh, aka Dividend and Dollars, and I met through Instagram, where she shares some awesome tidbits about how to invest in the stock market. This is actually the first time we met uh, and spoke to each other over Zoom. As far as I know, she is Canadian. And a big shout out to my Canadian friends who have always supported my channel, um, such as YouTube and Instagram. So hi, Kate. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming. Why do you think, this is a very serious question, why do you think Canadians are so nice? So um, honestly, I would say it has something to do with our geography. So we have a very large country, but a very small population. So when I think about that, um, especially in small towns, so I live in a very small city. Yeah. And I think when there's sort of zero degrees of separation, it really makes you accountable for how you treat people and how you act. Because at the end of the day, your children's school teacher is also someone you see at the grocery store and you'll yeah. also see at the soccer field. So I would say, um, Again, um, I like to say I love all Canadians, but I think especially when we talk about the smaller towns in Canada, there really is that sort of um, feeling of community and just treating your neighbor as well. Because again, um, you are going to meet someone, they're going to cross your path again and again, and yeah. you really want to make sure you have those positive interactions going forward. So did you and your family talk about finance growing up? So I would say um, I grew up investing with my dad. So my dad was a big investor, but this is back in the 90s. And I think investing has changed drastically um, in sort of the last 10 years. So absolutely, mm. I grew up investing, but I had to do a lot of self-learning. I would say how I invest now is still drastically different than how my dad invests. Like he was one of those people that had a guy at the bank yeah. that yeah. he invested with. And I would say, um, especially sort of millennials, um, we leverage met, um, more self-directed options. So I would say um, for anyone, regardless of sort of what their parents teach them or what they grew up with, you definitely have to put that accountability on yourself to learn more about what's out there. I mean, absolutely. My father knows nothing to do with crypto other than yeah. he's like, it has a blockchain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when did you start thinking about finance? So I would say as a kid I always loved money not in a materialistic way but I yeah. was always sort of the kid that wanted to make money and I was a sort of loved saving it and then also sort of watching it grow so I think yeah. I was just one of those kids that wanted a job really early on right. so I could make my own money so I could you know hoard it away but then also I could buy things I mm. recognized um my parents were quite frugal so if I wanted something specific it's not like they would just buy it for me so I think um those good money management skills are definitely something I grew up with. When did you start working? So my first job, I was maybe 12 yeah. and I picked weeds for a construction company. Wow. So again, this is back in the nineties. And yeah. back then um, there was like an employment center at our small town and they would like post an ad on a job board. Yeah. And it was a local construction company that was looking for someone to come pick weeds to clean up job sites. So yeah. my friend and I went and picked weeds. It was wow. horrible. But again, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things that I really wanted money. And that mm. was sort of. Was it yeah. paid <laughs> at least good? Oh, geez. I don't even know what minimum wage was back there. It's probably like <laughs> five some odd five dollars an hour maybe yeah I don't know <laughs> if you factor in the inflation I guess that's um pretty decent <laughs> yeah <laughs> so what's your relationship with finance like these days so I think I'm a little bit obsessed with it but mm. <laughs> which sounds horrible but in a good way yeah I think for me I'm really passionate about investing but then also making sure that Females get excited about investing and especially our daughter. So yeah. it's something that I've really become sort of passionate about making sure our daughter grows up knowing about sort of the power in investing, the power of money. I think when we talk about the gender wage gap, but then also mm -hmm. we're a, um, a multiracial family. So both my children and my husband identify as um, visible minorities. Mm -hmm. So I think it's even more important for me to know that my daughter has options and I think when we talk about investing what I love so much about investing is it 
doesn't matter. It doesn't mm. matter your race, your religion, your orientation. Um, a stock is a stock and a dividend is a dividend. And it's really like one of the few streams of business where it's completely anonymous and yeah. it doesn't matter if I buy something or Warren Buffett buys something, <laughs> we're treated exactly the same, which I think is really powerful um, yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. Great answer. Um, what do you do for a living? So right now I just invest full time. Um, yeah. I just started investing full time uh, about three months ago. Wow. Before that, I was a horrible person that worked in oil and gas. So <laughs> I worked for the largest, um, one of the largest energy uh, companies in North America. But yeah. now um, I just invest. Yeah, awesome. Do you think there's? Do you like the um, freedom aspect of that? Absolutely. So we have two small children and as everyone knows, sort of COVID has been a disaster, I think, for mm -hmm. everyone. But I, I like to think selfishly, it's also been a disaster for anyone who has small children. So the nice thing about investing is I automate most of my trade. So I work a fraction of the amount of time that I worked when I sold my soul to <laughs> the corporation. Yeah. And I think that's a really powerful thing. I think when we talk about opening your own business or having a side hustle, people don't realize that investing can be your job and you yeah. can just do it on your own time. You do your own research and it really is a really powerful tool. What's your day like? We closely align with the, well, we align perfectly with the time for the New York Stock Exchange. So yeah. essentially it's only open 9.30 to 4. So when we talk yeah. about sort of work-life balance, especially mm -hmm. for a mom, that is yeah. phenomenal yeah. so I tend to wake up early I wake up about 5 30 by then wow. sort of the free markets opened yeah. so I do things like I do some exercise stuff like that like the house is pretty quiet at that time my children mm -hmm. are thankfully still sleeping yeah. but I'll watch the pre-market if there's any trades that I want to put in I actually put those all in before the market opens mm -hmm. and then I'll get my sort of everyone up in the house, get them ready, get them set up for school or sent mm. off to school. And then I can adjust anything. So by then the pre-market's been open for two, three hours. Yeah. And it gives a good indication of what the market's going to be for the day. And then mm -hmm. I can adjust any of my trades before the market opens at 9.30. Yeah. Once the market opens, I tend not to actively trade throughout the day. I keep an eye on things, yeah. maybe... Um, depending on what sort of market news has come out, maybe I put in some price limits for stocks to buy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I do most of sort of my trading pre and then post market. Like I put those trades in for the day. And, but during the day, for the most part, I'm doing typical, it sounds like mom and wife and just house stuff. So I'm yeah. running errands. I'm shuffling my kids here and there. I'm cooking, yeah. I'm cleaning, just stuff that, Typically, I had to spend the weekends doing, yeah. and now I spend sort of during the day doing. Yeah. Is this like your dream kind of type of job? It is. Now, I will say um, my absolute dream is to really build up my um, dividends. So I will say I love to actively trade, but I would like to get to a point where I've built up enough high yield dividends that yeah. that sort of becomes half of my income per se. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any side hustles? So we don't, I would love to pick up a couple of investment properties. So we've yeah. talked about that for a while. The market is just crazy right now, especially in Canada. Yeah. So we're going to wait till that market cools off. Specifically, mm -hmm. I would love to get a cottage and use it sort of as a part-time Airbnb. Yeah. Do you sell anything on Marketplace? <laughs> so I do sell on Marketplace, all my kids stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I would say that's, um, the, so I don't really buy stuff and flip it per se, but um, yeah. I will say, especially now that I'm just investing, mm -hmm. um, I probably, this sounds like I have a ton of stuff, but I probably spend, like sell maybe $1,000 a month of stuff wow. on Marketplace. Okay. I feel yeah. like we have a lot of stuff, but also because <laughs> we live in the country, I feel like you accumulate a lot of stuff. Like, I feel like we might as well live on a farm for the amount of equipment that's in our like garage right. and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to have any side hustles or businesses in the future? Do you know what? I would. And that's what we've talked about sort of an investment property. Um, I would say outside of in investing though for me it's tough just sort of managing the work associated with a side hustle so I love the idea of a side hustle um what I have found is 
I think people assume that side hustles aren't a ton of work. And even if it's something like creating products on Etsy or classes or stuff like that, I think people assume it's completely passive income. And what yeah. I quickly, it's even a ton of work to do a blog. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, I think um, for me, investing sort of the best sort of option. Once my kids are a little bit older, I might sort of venture into maybe doing property management, maybe buying a few rental properties, things like that. Um, I definitely have a lot to learn for rental properties. As your name suggests on Instagram, it's dividend and dollars. <laughs> um, you invest in uh, stocks, spe specifically stocks that have high dividends. So what kind of stocks are you investing right now? So I largely invest in oil and gas stocks, which again, it makes me sound like I'm a terrible person. But um, when we look at the dividends is the dividends are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they're mm -hmm. sort of your classic value stocks. Their price to earning ratios tend to be a lot lower. Um, and yeah, they just really have these consistent dividends. So I own a lot of Again, it makes me sound like I'm a horrible person, but I own things like Exxon and Shell and Enbridge. Um, I own them both the parent companies, but a lot of them, things like Shell, they'll have the midstream version. I own those as well. Um, yeah, so I'm big into oil and gas. And then also a few of sort of pharmaceuticals. So things like Pfizer, again, the dividends tend to be phenomenal. So you're mm -hmm. looking at dividend yields of sort of up to 5%. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of real estate investment trusts. So things like Crown Castle, again, sort of classic Warren Buffett um, stocks. Those are all within my portfolios. I try to look for stocks that at least have a dividend yield of 3%. I have some in my portfolio that are up to 12%. Wow. Those are my favorite. Okay. Awesome. What, what are those? So I bought some Shell Midstream. Um, I don't know if I'll hold it for the long term, just because the endless ratings aren't the highest on it, but it is a 12% dividend yield. I bought Exxon, bought a pile of Exxon back last summer, and the dividend mm -hmm. yield was astronomical at it um, at the time. Um, I stocked up on Enbridge when it tanked. And again, um, recognizing the yield's not that high right now, but back when I bought it, sort of at half the price it is today, the yeah. yields on it was just astronomical. Things like Imperial Oil, Suncor. I mean, these companies, I hope, will evolve and become better for the environment. Mm. Um, but the dividends and the value with them, really, they are stable stocks that you yeah. can end up sort of building a great passive income portfolio with. Yeah. Did you get in when oil hit like the negatives? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time I was working in oil and gas, so I knew mm. enough about the business to sort of know who the big players were. Um, a lot of them have a regulated component with it. So again, when we talk about Enbridge, um, it's a large oil and gas company, but it's also a regulated utility. So that's a very stable revenue source. Yeah. And I think that all sort of plays into it. As much as I know a lot of people hate oil and they don't think oil is the future, and I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, for us to change our infrastructure and go completely electric is just not feasible. It's not going to happen in the next three, five, or even 10 years. Mm. And then at least in Canada, the vast majority of electricity is actually created using natural gas. So again, if we were to completely electrify the grid, we would mm. actually have to increase our consumption of oil and gas, which mm. would drive up sort of the revenue for a company like Enbridge. Yeah, right. Are you investing in any other, the more hypey type of stocks, like Apple no. and Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I own a bit of Apple. Um, yeah. I would say I have like, I joke that if I go to Tim Hortons or McDonald's at, you know, six o'clock in the morning when I wake up, I can talk about my stock portfolio <laughs> with the retirees sitting in the parking lot. I literally <laughs> own what, you know, people would joke that their grandparents own. I have the yeah. least exciting portfolio out there. So I tend to own just a lot of stocks of really old companies. Yeah. I would say. As long as the, the numbers add up, I suppose. Yeah. So the I'd balance like sheet. The, Exactly. So like the coolest stock I think I own is probably Apple. I have a couple um, uh, cannabis. I guess that would be sort of yeah, yeah. super cool. <laughs> that's very cool. <laughs> but that's about like, it's not like I own um, a lot of EVs or anything like mm -hmm. that. I have a pretty 
I own Walmart and Costco. Like that's about as cool as I get. <laughs> so you don't um, tend to diversify. Would you say I you... do? A, so I um, purchase a lot of in Canada, like our S and P index. So it's called mm-hmm. Vanguard's uh, the yeah. tickers VFE. So mm-hmm. I would say that's where my diversification um, mm-hmm. within my stocks. I tend to stick with dividend stock so I do have a little bit in there so I like I have Starbucks things like mm. that but it's not like I have a lot of green or growth again you know I have a little bit of tech so I have things like I do have a little bit of AMD and Oracle and Apple but I don't really get into things that are going to grow overnight so when yeah. you talk about like Trade Desk or DraftKings or really sort of IPO or SPAC stocks mm-hmm. I own none of them. Maybe I, you know, maybe I pick up one or two of them, but I would say I own as much of that as I own of crypto sort of thing. Yeah. So they, again, that would be less than 1% of my portfolio. Um, are you then a long-term uh, holder or do you also do a bit of swing trading or day trading? So I would say um, I'm a long-term holder of all of our index. So when we sort of talk about our children's uh, education trusts or our RESPs in Canada that are RSPs, which is our um, long-term retirement funds. We do 100% index for those. Mm-hmm. What we actively trade are two brokerage accounts. And then what we have in Canada, which is called a tax-free savings account, where you can just mm-hmm. shelter investments. We actively mm-hmm. trade both of those accounts. So I sort of have a mix of high dividend stocks, but I'm mm-hmm. actively trading them. Things like Abermorel is a good example. I'll buy it when it dips. I'll sell it when mm. it's high and then I'll buy it again. So sometimes mm. depending on the timing, I miss out on the dividends because I haven't hit that ex-dividend date. Mm. But I would say I'm actively turning over my value stocks every time there's sort of an adjustment of that individual stock. So, you know, I picked up Boeing when it tanked. I'll sell it once the economy sort of reopens mm. and it peaks a little more, then I'll sell it and then maybe I'll buy it back later. Uh, Some of the stocks I'll own for the long term, things like Exxon and Shell that I bought basically at the 15 year low, I'll probably Mm. hold those ones. Um, But even Disney, I picked up when it was around $100. I just sold it the other day sort of thing. So would Disney be a great long term hold? Yeah, but it wasn't paying a dividend. I felt like I had sort of almost made 100%. It wasn't bad to sort of take that and reinvest in something else. Speaking of investing in stocks, you can get up to $150 worth of free stocks by visiting the referral link below for Stake, which is an online stock trading platform that trades numerous US stocks. Do you budget? (laughs) So I will say I used to budget. Now, the only sort of budgeting we do is we do that method where we talk about sort of paying ourselves first, where Mm -hmm. we make sure we meet our investment contributions. Mm -hmm. But then for the most part, we're at a spot where we don't owe any money. So we're debt-free, mortgage-free. So that budgeting component isn't as important as it was early on in our lives. That being said, I think we're very frugal. So it's not like where you get in a situation that at the end of the month, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have no more money left. Um... We tend not to be big spenders. Um, So it's not that we, I'm more sort of conscious of it as a daily basis, but it's Mm -hmm. not like I say, we only have $200 to spend on groceries this week. We've spent that. No, we're not buying anything else. It's more, Mm -hmm. you know, when we're building that grocery cart because we do our grocery shopping online, we sort of keep tabs on it. And, you know, if for some reason I built a grocery cart and it was $500, I'd be like, oh, that's a bit too much. Let's go back through and no, we don't need... I don't know, 18 different bags of potato chips or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a veggie garden? We do. Yeah. Um, we used to have a huge garden. Our garden this year is much smaller. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have massive um, raised like garden beds that we used to grow a ton of stuff. And then once our kids got sort of to the active age, we ripped them all out. But then this year we've gone back and sort of done smaller planters. And yes, they're a great way to sort of, we grow beans and tomatoes and a few other things, nothing crazy, but just enough that you always have fresh local produce Mm -hmm. that is organic and things like that. Do you have any money saving tips? Ooh, 
so I think um, what's really sort of helped me growing up is realizing that I think there's a big societal push for people to think that they need things. And I think uh, marketing has done a great job for you to yes. say, you need this and that and this and that. And I think sort of as a family, we've really sort of come to realize like we don't need any of that stuff. And the best example I can give is we didn't have internet for over 10 years. And people wow. say, how could you live without internet? And we just got internet when COVID happened. And the thing is like, you wow. think you need it? We mm -hmm. didn't have it and we did not miss it. Yeah, so wow. we didn't have Netflix. We didn't mm -hmm. have all the stuff that sort of comes with internet and we didn't mm -hmm. miss it at all. It's one of those things that mm -hmm. a lot of us think you need new cars or you need fancy clothes and stuff like that. And it's one of those things you start to go without it and you realize you never needed it. Even now I don't have data on my cell phone and people wow. say, but how do you, how do you check something? Mm -hmm. You don't need to. Um, so that would, I would say is like my number one tip is mm. you don't need all the stuff and the subscriptions and the, mm. I hear people who have Netflix, Amazon, yeah, and they'll have like three different TV subscriptions and they'll mm. have a satellite. And I'm like, Ooh. you don't need any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing is just never pay full price for anything. So just really trying to be a savvy shopper. So, you know, spend that five minutes and look for a good deal. And, mm. you know, especially with kids, I tend to buy in advance so I'll buy one or two seasons ahead just because you can pick things up when they're on sale yeah and then the last is we use dividends to sort of fund fiscally irresponsible life choices <laughs> the best <laughs> example is it's not about saying no to everything so we belong yeah. to a private golf course those are not cheap we pay for it all with dividends and that's sort of our way to be fiscally responsible with a irresponsible choice yeah besides stocks what else are you investing in? So I just started to dabble in crypto. I realized yes. that I'm about 10 years late when I hear that you yeah. were crypto mining in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exactly seven years late to the party. That's okay. uh, yeah. So again, like it's not going to be a huge portion of my portfolio. I'd say yeah. um, it will sort of be 1% sort of thing. But for me, it's more just learning more about the blockchain um, technology. I actually think there's a huge opportunity to use blockchain technology in energy. So when we talk about sort of Ethereum being used in the music industry, I actually think it would be phenomenal to have an energy blockchain. Yeah, fantastic. So what are you investing in, in terms of cryptocurrency? Uh, so I went super crazy about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing I'll need to. It's kind of a good time, right? Because it's uh, dropped a quite a lot in the last few days. Definitely. Yeah. Are you going to uh, buy any more in the future? I probably will. So again, sort of like how I stock up on value stocks, um, I bought on the dip. Um, I probably won't buy any more until maybe I see it sort of dip again or um, the platforms that I would say I'm just learning more about sort of the different platforms that you can easily purchase on. And especially when I look at things like Coinbase, the fees can get quite high mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy to sort of link with direct deposits with my bank and stuff like that so you end up paying credit card fees which can really cut into your profits if you're looking to trade but then also can make it a lot more expensive if you're looking to hold it on uh, long term so i'll sort of just probably watch the market um mm -hmm. if it drops again i'll probably sort of double down um i sort of gave myself a budget and i've spent half of that budget and i want to sort of keep the other half to mm. when there's another dip yeah want to invest in crypto with ease use the sign up link to coin spot below to claim ten dollars worth of bitcoin now back to the show what do you think money can help you with so I would say really it's just the freedom. I mean, people talk, if people think it's somehow gonna, going to change your life to make them more happy or healthier or anything like that, it's not. It gives you a lot of freedom to sort of pursue volunteering opportunities, your passions, whether it's your hobbies or things like that. But other than that, I mean, it's not like most people drastically change their lifestyles because they're investing so for me it's being able to have the opportunity to not work in sort of a traditional job and I can spend some more time home with my family but it doesn't mean I'm going out to buy 
I don't know, like a, a jet or a yacht so I can <laughs> sail around the world or things like that. Mm-hmm. It's more for me just being able to pursue different passions, spend time with my kids yeah. and do some volunteering, which I never had the time to sort of do before. Are you volu- currently volunteering? Yes. Yeah, so I do a little bit of volunteering with, um, we sort of have a women's shelter, so oh, doing wow. some volunteering to help uh, women do some budgeting and stuff like that. A lot of times um, they've never sort of been on their own financially, so to yeah. talk to them about how to build a budget, how to do things like invest, um, making sure that people aren't caught up. And sometimes even in Canada, we have things like scholarship trusts where they can really be scammy about the fees associated Mm -hmm. with um, children's educational trusts. Uh So they sort of sucker you in and they take sort of three or 4%, which can really cut into the market returns and just Mm -hmm. sort of letting people know the different options that are out there and sort of steering them away from what they might see at like a a baby show about, Ooh, over here, we'll make your, make sure you have lots of money when your kid goes off to school, all sort of thing. Okay, so those are the main questions. Uh, Now, are you ready for the lightning round, Kate? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Number one, do you think money can bring you happiness? So no, and I think um, what people actually find is a lot of people who have are quite wealthy are actually terribly unhappy. And I think there's this association that people think when they become wealthy that it will somehow solve all their problems. And I would say, if anything, it can really enhance the problems in your life. And I mean, yeah, and that's why it's really important that you sort of find what makes you happy. It will never be money. And if um, you think money will bring you happiness, then you'll never have enough money to be happy. Great answer. If you had won $20 million, what would you do? It sounds so awful. I'd probably just invest a portion of it, donate a portion of it, and maybe pick up an investment property. I mean, nothing crazy at the end of the day. Um, we wouldn't change our lifestyle, but I think that's the great thing about sort of investing and growing your wealth is you can give more of it away. Yeah. Number three, what is your favorite financial book? Finance book. So it's not a finance book, but the two books that I absolutely love is I love Freakonomics, which isn't a traditional sort of finance book, but I think it's a great read. And then I just picked up this other book. So I'm a data scientist by trade. And so I just picked up this book the other day called Everybody Lies. And I think it's absolutely the best book that everyone should read. And really sort of talks about how people lie and sort of the author of the book analyzes Google searches and they say sort of that's the truth and people lie on Instagram, they lie on surveys and sort of they lie to themselves but when they go on Google they actually the truth comes out and it sort of analyzes the different things across sort of North America and it really gives you some insight into that's you're not alone in the world and what you think other people might have or how other people might be happy is much more sort of a persona that they're giving you and not Mm. necessarily the truth. And I think for a lot of people and especially sort of females, I think it's important for people to see that truth in other people. And I think often people get caught up in um, what other people are showing them and not realizing mm. that's not their daily lives. So I would definitely recommend it as an excellent read to anyone. Um, Rent it from the library. Don't purchase it on yeah. Amazon. It's much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin O'Leary or Kathy Wood? Can I pick Warren Buffett? Only because <laughs> what <laughs> yes, I you can. dislike about a lot of mainstream investors, it's a lot of sort of grandstanding and a lot of like, bells and whistles but if why i love about mr buffett is he tells you not to buy his stock like he is the worst salesman in the entire world he'll tell you don't buy berkshire half away buy a low fee index that mirrors the s&p because you're better off that way and he'll say like mm. i love my company but don't buy my stock you're better off buying yeah. and and i think that's sort of the sign of a great investor is yeah. there's no indicators candlesticks like he keeps it so simple Mm -hmm. and 
there's no fluff about it. And I love the fact that like he goes to McDonald's and gets like a $2 yeah. egg McMuffin. Every morning. And he, you know, <laughs> yes. And you know, he doesn't drive a fancy car, you know, when yeah. his last car dies, he'll buy a new one. He still lives in an original house. And I just feel like there's this humbleness to him. Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. <laughs> well, I will give them both credit for their entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, when we talk about their creativity and their ability to have vision, I think they're both phenomenal for that. I will not take anything away from that. Elon, <laughs> um, uh, I think my only criticism of Elon, I just think he should keep some stuff to himself. Like yeah. he can just, you know, those things like, you don't have to tell the world everything all the time. Just feel free to just, keep it on the DL like just <laughs> yeah but I mean again from an entrepreneurial standpoint they are both visionaries and I am saying they are definitely deserve all the success they've had um from an entrepreneurial standpoint yeah and finally where can we find you on social media so um like we had said earlier I'm on Instagram at dividends and dollars and that is it of this episode of Mola Mola. And thanks to Kate for coming on to my show. Make sure to check out her Instagram. If you like this podcast, please share, like, and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Don't forget to check out my links below to sign up for freebies. Let me know what you thought of this episode by visiting my Facebook page. Just search The Frugal Millennial. Thanks for listening.